Uh, and welcome to the APSC Cloud Forum on Cardiovascular Disease Series. Today, we shall be talking about dyslipidemia management across the total lifespan for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease prevention. And we will be looking at it from an Asia Pacific point of view. We have six fantastic speakers who will be talking to you for the next two and a half hours, delivering 20 minute lectures with five minutes Q&A in between. As a preface, we as clinicians are often facing this lipidemia dilemma and its management, mainly hypercholesterolemia, is a key strategy in prevention in the prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, such as the kidney syndrome, the stroke, and peripheral artery disease. For familial hypercholesterolemia, the threat of hypercholesterolemia itself can start as young as in utero, right up to um, being in adulthood and to the older age. How we as clinicians decide on medication therapy, lifestyle intervention, the usage of statins, PCSK9 inhibitor, et cetera, as well as newer drugs across the total human life will be the focus of our lecture this afternoon, this morning. We know that multiple clinical trial-based evidences are accumulating in primary and secondary prevention to try and control atherosclerotic cardiovascular events, yet, we are still groping in the dark for special populations, such as young adults, adolescents, uh, women of productive age, and the very elderly. So welcome again. My name is Sazli Kasim. I'm a cardiologist, professor and director of UITM Teaching Hospital in Malaysia. I'm also a council member with the National Heart, as well as a fellow with the ESC. My co-chair this morning, this afternoon is Dr. Po Sun, po Sun Huang, a professor and division chief from the Institute of Clinical Medicine, National Yang Ming Chao Tong University from Taiwan, who will also be a speaker later on. We are very honored to have our first speaker for this morning, this afternoon. That is Dr. Prani Kanakroch from Thailand, who is an assistant professor and endocrinologist. And she is currently attached to the Department of Laboratory Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism, Chilalangkorn University, Thailand. She will be lecturing us on dyslipidemia management for primary prevention of ASCVD, children and adolescents, the who, when, and the how. Dr. Purani, your mic is muted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introductions. I'm Dr. Korani Kinnagorod from the Heart Association of Thailand, an endocrinologist, and I'm very feel honored to be here in the webinar discussions today. So let's start with my talk. Okay. Um, the outline will be uh, the atherosclerosis in children and the who is at risk, the when to start screening or evaluations, and the how to manage. Atherosclerosis starts since childhood. There were um, some of contemporary studies that uh, have evidence that the earliest stage of atherosclerosis that already started at uh, the first two decades of life, that was the fatty streets. And here is uh, the figure. You can see that um, the prevalence of fibrous plague here, the prevalence since, since the age of two and increasing with age in the fibrous plague in both of aorta and coronary arteries. Another uh, results from the Bogalusa Heart Study, which is the uh, long-term epidemiolog epidemiologic study of the cardiovascular risk factors that uh, conduct the autopsy around in 200 per young persons aged 2 to 39 years old who die from various causes, mostly from trauma. And see here in the table of the correlation coefficient of the anti mortem risk factors. The LDL cholesterol showed the highest correlation coefficient and significantly correlated to the area of the fatty streets in young adults. So we now know that atherosclerosis started since in childhood. So who is at risk? Um, the risk uh, categorized in grading like high risk group uh, are among the homozygous FH diabetes and state renal disease, Kawasaki disease with persistent aneurysms. The moderate risk group uh, are the children with severe obesity, heterozygous FH, hypertension, coarctation, and pre-dialysis, 
chronic kidney disease and aortic stenosis patient. And the patient with at risk in, are in obesity child, uh, child with insulin resistance with comorbidities, or maybe even white coat hypertension and other cardiomyopathies, and children with the chronic disease like inflammatory conditions like SLE, uh, HIV, or have the anomalies of coronary artery. Let's focus on the familial hypercholesterolemia or FH, which is the most common inherited cardiovascular disease. The prevalence is around one in 250 in heterocytous FH and one in about 300,000 in homocytous FH, uh, which the disease caused by the mutations in LDL receptor mediated pathway like the LDL gene, FOB gene, and PCSK9 gene. FH uh, is significantly and substantially associated with the premature atheros atherosclerosis and uh, eventually uh, give to the result of premature death. The clinical detection of FH in children and adolescents. For homozygous FH, uh, the LDL level can reach high to around 400 to 500 milligram per deciliters. And of course, the presence of cutaneous symptoms, mostly the first presentation, if uh, have this presentation is very strongly suggestive of the disease. For heterocytous FH, uh, we can detect these patients and patients with uh, maybe the siblings of the one who had FH before or the ones who have family history of elevated LDL cholesterol or premature cardiovascular disease. The LDL level will be around 150 milligram per deciliter. The presence of cutaneous or tenderness syndrome may, may be present or maybe not. Here's the illustrations of the cutaneous centroma seen here, the yellowish plaque seen in the flexor areas of the wrists, of the knees, and, and the, on the ankles, or maybe seen in other regions having mechanical stress. So later, this is our patient uh, who is homosexual if since the age of six years old and later in her adolescent, she still exhibit the uh, centoma and at the oculus tendon and the tuber centoma or the flat uh, or elevated nodules over joints area like knees and elbows. Let's see the list of the primary dyslipidemia that's seen with centoma when we uh, would like to give differential diagnosis. The familial hypercholesterolemia the familial defective AFOB, both diseases are autosomal dominant and quite have a very high level of LDL cholesterol uh, and also high, very high risk of cardiovascular disease. The autosomal recessive hypercholesterolemia also exhibit with xanthoma, a moderate amount of LDL level would have the abnormal in the LDL RAP1 gene. The citrosterolemia uh, has the quite uh, moderate amount of LDL level uh, increase and maybe have other manifestations like uh, hemolytic anemia, stomatocytosis, or thrombocytopenia. And the last one, the cerebral tenderness xanthomatosis. From uh, the disease is from the names that have the abnormal of the cholesterol deposit in other tissues because the abnormal in this gene causing the defect in enzymes in biosynthesis pathway. So the crystal will deposit in other tissue like the brain causing the seizure or like in the, the eyes causing cataract in other ten tendon causing the centoma to be seen. And um, the, la the lab result will see the normal or low level of LDL cholesterol. The classification of lipid level in children and adolescents uh, the LDL cholesterol that is high is about 130 milligram per deciliter. And for thyroglyceride, if less than 10 years old, the number of more than 100 milligram per deciliter is high. And about 130 milligram per deciliter in age 10 to 20 years for thyroglyceride level. And when to start lipid screening? The benefit of lipid screening is, of course, to early prevent the 
the development of risk factors, which are, and which is the primary prevention, and of course to recognize and then manage the children with at increased risk, like family hypercholesterolemia patient or FSH patient, which usually remain under diagnosis worldwide nowadays. To screen or not to screen is the debate in several academy and institutions like listed in here. The reasons behind to not to screen is the insufficient evidence to recommend for or against the routine screening. And for the evidence for the screening is that uh, in usually uh, mostly in the level of evidence grade B, there were two methods of screening. The selective screening would start screening since the age of two in children with risk, such as premature cardiovascular disease in family members and parents with total cholesterol more than 240, or uh, the children with risk like diabetes, hypertension, and severe obesity. And uh, the, another method is, is universal screening, or would start around nine years old, and again, do the you know, so screening again after puberty at the age of 17. Uh, how to screen is to, you can do both of them fasting or fasting lipid profile. And then how to manage the dyslipidemia in children and adolescents. We have to compose of several uh, uh, strategies, like firstly, with dietary recommendations and uh, encouragement of the physical activity in child, smoking avoidance, which include the smoke, the smoke, the secondhand smoker to be avoided and to maintain healthy weight and of course the medication. It, this is the algorithm that simplify from the pediatrics guideline with, that start with the fasting lipid profile twice time and average that resolves. If the LDL it sees 250 or a triglyceride, it sees 500 that is very high, just refer to the lipid specialist. And if the level is in between that, maybe we should look for uh, the next step that to exclude the secondary causes and to evaluate risk factors of that patient like hypertension, renal disease, or uh, obesity, and, for, and encourage the diet and lifestyle change around six months, and then repeat the lipid profile again. If the LDL level exceeds 190 milligram per deciliters, that is the threshold for start the statin. If the level in between 130, 289, maybe consider statin treatment in patient with risk factor. For triglyceride level, if the level is higher than 200 milligram per deciliter, maybe you should start the fish oil medication and uh, consult to the lipid specialist. And in between that, uh, in 100 to 200 in the age of more than 10, uh, in the, more than 10, uh, or in the age of less than 10 years old, or 130 to 200 in the age of more than 10 years old, maybe you should uh, adapt the diet to uh, give more of fish dietary fish and repeat the lab again in six months. And let's see, and this slide will show the causes of secondary dyslipidemia in childhood and adolescence. Yeah, um, so the recommendation for the lab to evaluate is the thyroid status, the glucose, the creatinine and liver, and of course the urine analysis studies. For the treatment targets based on cardiovascular risk factor uh, stated in the circulation for stratify patient in the risk group and give the threshold of the LDL cholesterol to be 130 to start uh, management. Uh, and, and the guidelines state that we can uh, initiate statin with the lifestyle change simultaneously if the LDL more than 130 in high risk group patient and the goal is to reach the lower of LDL than 100 milligram per deciliter. In moderate risk and at risk group patient, if the LDL exceeds 160 milligram per deciliter, should start with the uh, therapy, therapeutic lifestyle change first. And if the goal is not is not reached at the LDL level less than 130 milligram per deciliter, maybe consider the medications. The recommendations of dietary management will be the child one diet and child to diet protocols. And child one diet uh, will focus on the uh, total fat, 
less than 25 to 30% of total calories with the fat fats less than 10% and the crystal less than 300 milligram per deciliter. If the patient still cannot control their crystal level, then move to the next step of the childhood diet that uh, lessen the sad fat less than 7% and the crystal less than 200 milligram per day. And of course, avoid trans fat as much as possible and uh, initiate or uh, encourage the high fi dietary fiber. For medications, statin uh, actually have used uh, for quite a while in children and many large clinical trials has demonstrated efficacy and safety following 20 years of statin treatment with uh, no significant side effects. And you can start statin at the age of eight, initiate with low dose and uh, measure the response and safety in four to six weeks. Before initiating statin, the guideline recommend to measure transaminase and creatine kinase before initiating statin. And alcohol should be counseled for blood control. Other add-on medications with statins like acetamide, this is K9 inhibitor, biosequestrants, lomitopi, this is oral form, and even I could map the injections form. Yeah, has have been studied uh, in patients, mostly in FH patients, with uh, starting dose and maximum dose and give uh, add-on reductions of the LDR reduction. Then the other model modalities of treatment is the LDR paresis and liver transplant with portal cablation in rare cases. The raw genetic testing is benefit that will may predict the responsiveness to treatment. And of course, if you cannot do the genetic testing, it's fine because actually the intensity of treatment is guided by the LDL crystal level, not the, not the genotype. For the raw cardiac imaging, only the homozygous FH that should indicate it for comprehensive cardiovascular imaging since the diagnosis. For others, routine cardiac monitoring with imaging vascular imaging is not needed. The last one that, that I would like to mention is the LP level A that is uh, a useful marker that have increasing uh, study that associated with the high risk patient and maybe uh, the useful marker to uh, identify the high risk patient group. That's the, the last slide of my presentations today, I would like to thank you to the Thai Heart Society of Thailand and Endocrine Society of Thailand that work together to uh, put awareness of FH in Thai. We have the Thai FH Network that you can visit our website and our activities to raise awareness and do the uh, studies in FH in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Porali. Very wholesome uh, lecture, as you uh, demonstrate quite clearly um, the clinical uh, findings and also right up to the uh, therapy. Uh, maybe uh, one question, especially for the clinicians out there. Uh, once you have a diagnosis and you are going to start on statin therapy, um, how do you do it? What type of statin do you use? What's your initial dose? How many days? Wait a week before you upgrade them. How do you motivate these kids? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I will start studying uh, since the eight, the age of eight years old. And actually, the most stated I choose is Lozawa Satin, as this uh, is the very first study type that study in children. And might start with the low dose, like five milligrams, and maybe. Maybe start with the alternate day because the long half life is setting up the loss was setting, and because some uh, some kids may have exhibited some side effect or like myopathy as well. But uh, then if we start small and slow, they can tolerate that. Okay. And how how do you convey to the kids on the need to take uh, statin medication? Yeah, this is. Um, this is a very interesting question. Before a start treatment, we have to assess for the contribution from the family members, from the parents, from uh, assess their understanding of the disease that has to be the long-term management if they're, uh, since they are FH, right? And of course, um, they'll have to 
I would have to ask for help from their parents and to, to guide their children because maybe the children uh, at the very first visit, they were scared of us, of our white gown. They will not give us a trust. I think uh, collaborative uh, treatment with the parent will do a lot of help. How frequent do you see them? Um, actually, very, very few because uh, I will see uh, these patients like after they come to the adult clinic because I'm PD, I'm not the PD, pediatricians, I'm the adult endocrinologist, but like uh, some like because I do the study of FS, so I collective, so I do collective some data of the homosexual FS, so I, I see that patient. But personally, I I didn't start. Uh, the medication myself, most of will be the pediatricians and maybe uh, uh, I would see afterwards they come to the adolescent and adult clinic. Yes. And do you practice checking your blood for evidence of myositis or abnormal liver function as they continue to take the statin therapy or do we not bother? Uh, if, uh, you, you mean if there are some transaminitis occur, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Of course, uh, we will check for their uh, transaminitis level, uh, uh, the ST and ALT level. And yeah, I, I do, I once uh, see the case from a uh, pediatrist, pedi pediatrician sent to me that uh, they have the transaminitis from the statin treatment. So, uh, but when we look for at that time, they have drug interactions with the antibiotics that the patients was prescribed during the illness at that time and have the drug interactions that give the AST and LT sky high. And then so we reevaluate and stop the medications for a while to uh, wait for the ACAT to normalize and then we change other statin type. And then the, that child can go on another statin type can turtle stem treatment, yes. Brilliant. Um, just out of interest, how many patients do you have in your study right now? Uh, how many? About um, two to 300 patients. Wow. Yes. That's very impressive. Uh, uh, um, but uh, include heterozygous as well, not, not all the homozygous. Okay. Right, okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pranya. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, we shall move on to our speaker, um, Dr. Wong J. Lee. He's an associate professor from Seoul National University, Unak in uh, Korea. He is an interventional cardiologist who has been practicing uh, more than 16 years, an active member of the Korean Society of Cardiology, and a graduate of Seoul National University Medical School in 2004. Uh, Dr. Wong Jae Lee will be talking to us on the lipidemia management for primary prevention of ASCVD in the young adults between 20 to 39 years of age. Again, who and when, and also how do we approach this particular topic? Uh, thank you, Chairman. So um, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm Wonja Lee from Seoul National Funda Hospital, Korea. Uh, I'm interventional cardiologist. So I'm going to be talking about uh, primary prevention for 20 to 39 years of age. So um, there are actually dedicated guidelines for this age group. So it was it was a bit hard to find a many a much literature, but I'll try to my best try my best to generate some insights uh, that we can share today. So I'm going to talk about what are issues in this young adults, 20 to 39, and what do current guidance say. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on young adults with FH because this is a very important population. And I'm gonna uh, talk about a little bit of suggestion. So what are the issues? Let me talk, uh, you know, start my talk with a, a case. So very young patient with dyslipidemia and smoking. So um, 35 year old male came in, with chest pain, uh, brief arrest, uh, and luckily RSC in four minutes, ECG shows um, empiric STEMI. So we uh, went on for a, a prior PCI. So patient had a dyslipidemia, smoking, and did not have any other risk factor like hypertension or diabetes. 
So if you look at the NGO, you can see that their total collusion in uh, PDA and also PA branch. But it doesn't seem like it, uh, thrombosis happened here. I think this is a, the plaque rupture happened here and the thrombus migrated down there. So we did a ballooning and some suctioning multiple times. And finally, we could open the arteries. But you still see the very high risk plate looking uh, lesion is up front. So, what are we going to do next? So, um, I think LDL cholesterol is really a building block for, of atherosclerosis. Yes, coagulation or platelet or inflammation are all important factors to develop atherosclerosis, but I think LDL cholesterol is main, uh, the main factor. And from the interheart NICE study, we know that not smoking or even above diabetes, hypertension, it is the, one of the most critical modifier risk factors for acute MI, meaning if we control LDL, then we can prevent a lot of uh, acute MI. However, uh, for young adults after an MI, uh, statin is not indicated in a lot of time. So this is a young MI registry. It, it's, well, it's not 20, 30, but this is a registry uh, having read relatively you know, younger population. So in this registry, who is the first MI, uh, if you look at, we, we apply 2013 ACC-AC guideline, starting recommended in only 31% of population and not recommended in 51%. So that is a very huge issue. And patient like this patient who only had a smoking, then he wouldn't have recommended statin. And 51% would not have been eligible for statin treatment. So this is a very big problem in this population. This is another registry called Duke Registry. Uh, this is also evaluated a patient with, uh, there is a subgroup with a 55 years of age. If we look at, if we apply 2013 guideline, 56%, 7% are only eligible, meaning another 40% was not eligible for statin therapy, even though they experienced a QMI. 2018 guideline made some changes and you know have paid more attention to these young adults, but but the reality was that only 46 are eligible for standard therapy, meaning another 50 were not uh, eligible uh, for standing use for even they are at very high risk for developing this kind of disease. I think you are now very aware of lifetime cumulative burden of elder cholesterol. So um, we look at the RCTs, the relative risk reduction is about 22%. But with Mendel analysis, we look at genetic LDL score, it's actually more than 50%, meaning lifetime burden of lipid is more, it's very important. So let's assume if somebody has LDL cholesterol 125, if he just keep on that way, he might be getting MI at the age of 60. But if we do some intervention, lower the LDL cholesterol, if we can get down to like a uh, more or less at 80, this patient might not get MI until the age of 100. So we should really think about the lifetime burden and the importance of early intervention. And one other uh, issue that I want to talk about is that in this young population, uh, there are a lot of people who has a FH but are not diagnosed. And in fact, in this young adult population, uh, coronary heart disease is 11 times more compared to who does not have uh, FH. So this is also a huge problem. And we can see that they're at very, very high risk. And also FH diagnosis, median age on 47. So meaning most of the people in young adults, while they're having this kind of uh, FH, they are not diagnosed. So this is also a big issue in this young adult population. So what do current guidelines say about this young adults? In fact, in 2018 ACC AHA guideline, actually at the very beginning, they mentioned about 20 to 30 uh, in young adults as a top 10 take home message. But this message only says an assessment lifetime risk facilitates clinical patient risk discussion, not really mentioning how are we gonna treat these patients. Uh, I literally just copied all the quotes that was in the guideline mentioning about adults 20 to 39 here. So, uh, there was a mention in diabetes population. If, uh, the, if young adults has a, a diabetes, then moderate intensity can be uh, considered. However, 
I see here and there a lot of uh, in, here and there saying there's limited information on ACBD rates and the RCT regarding these populations. So there are some recommendations, but they're not really strong recommendation for use of drug therapy for this population. This is another section that uh, specifically talk about young adults. So you can see, they say prevention of clinical ACVD optimally begins early in life. However, given the lack of evidence, they don't strongly recommend um, the medication. It also says FAs often goes under undiagnosed, but if somebody has primary elevation of more than 190, they recommend medication. When, when, and the other one that's catching my eye was that they were recommending coronal altered calcium scores. So what's in the guideline currently? These are, uh, these are all, there are only three sections that talks about uh, that apply to these young adults. So if somebody, young adult has a long duration of diabetes, then starting can be uh, recommended, but it's only to be here. And look at here, if somebody has a, uh, uh, has a premature history of ACVD family, or if they have, and they have more than one sixth of LD cholesterol, then statin therapy can be considered. And the other is if they have 190, over 190 cholesterol, then no risk assessment, high intense statin right away. But that's only sections that they mention about this population. Um, there was a very recent bind was, uh, was there in 2021 with ADA. And this is also has this, uh, this two lines here. For patient with diabetes, age 20, 39, with additional risk factor, it may be reasonable to initiate statin in the to lifestyle. So, um, and I couldn't really find any quotes in the ESC guideline. So this is pretty much what we have for this uh, young adult population. Uh, let me switch a little bit to FH. So in this population, FH are important, but are not really found. So in fact, worldwide, uh, what we found is about one, one out of 500, but in reality, what we think is that it's really one out of 200. So a lot of times we're missing uh, FH diagnosis. So what happens is that if you look at here, uh, in the age of 80, who are diagnosed FH, the, the number of men are very small. That's because they say many men with FH had died at earlier age. And in 2039, the problems are low because they are not detected. So that is also a huge problem. There, were, uh, there was a, um, a statistics regarding our uh, Asian population. And you look at there, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, estimate diagnosis only 1%, which is far from the reality. So I think still this is very, very big problem in our Asian population. Uh, I think you all know about uh, FH and uh, progress are sclerosis. I'm going to just skip this slide. So we should use Simon Brew for the criteria but a lot of cases in our clinical practice, we, we, are, we cannot reach really definite diagnosis and cannot really provide optimal treatment. So once again, FH is associated with a significant increase in risk of CHD. So let's look at somebody who do not have uh, FH. So if cumulative LDL cholesterol six, uh, six, uh, 600 milligram would be a threshold CHD, then this patient will have some event around 55. However, if this patient is homozygous, then very early on, and heterozygous around 30, and if they have more risk factor, if they're male, they smoke, have diabetes, then the source threshold goes down. Even in the 20s or 30s, they can have MI or some sort of AC, uh, coronary heart disease. So lowering, uh, detecting FH is very, very important to control the risk in this population. Again, uh, this is uh, the blues are patient who has LD plus one less than 130. And these grays are patient who has uh, cholesterol 190. So in older age, the difference is not that big, well, still, still like more than 1.5%. Uh, but if you look at the very, very younger age, the risk, ACV, the risk for adults with FH are significant. And in this population, in younger population, it's more than fivefold. So Again, it's very important to identify these population uh, in this age group. So why important? 
just knowing it's not, you know, that's what we want, but we know that early initiation statin actually help. So you get the graph. Parents' FH, even for pre-survival, dramatically decreases. However, if they were diagnosed early on, if in children and they're treated, uh, uh, you know, statin and also other agents, you know, they have very, very uh, less event and actually very comparable to general population as well. However, the, the other factor is that even though uh, patients use statin, about only 20 or 30% of patients are actually achieving LDL cholesterol 100. If, if we apply 70, well, it, it will be far lower. So that's also a problem. Consider that 50% of population in this uh, studies had more than uh, about 50% LDL cholesterol reduction, but still they are not reaching their target goal. So monotherapy alone, I think, will not you know, do much for this uh, FH patient. So in the past, uh, ESC's guideline, we're talking about uh, LDL plus 100, and if they have CBD, they suggest it's 70. It was the same for heterozygous or homozygous FH. However, uh, in 2019, the guideline has heightened their, uh, their bar. So if FH with a CBD or with another major risk factor, they put, a, put them in a very high risk. And if they have just FH, then they're still at high risk. The recommendation was that very high risk, more than 55, and high risk is 70. So compared to um, a previous guideline, the threshold for the elder class goal has been lowered for FH patient as well. And as you can see here with class one indication, FH should be diagnosed using clinical criteria and also familial cascade screening is recommended. And the more than 50% reduction and lower than 55 was recommended and using PCSK9 is also strongly recommended in this population. So what are some suggestions from literature? So uh, what I found was that um, a lot of uh, so, uh, lit literature suggests that they were uh, suggesting broader use of coronal artery calcium screening because we all know that CC score actually are very independent from other risk factors and very useful for identifying and risk stratification of ASCVD. So uh, they were suggesting using a CAC score and uh, they were suggesting there should be some improvement for risk enhancer so that we can really capture the risk, uh, high risk population in this young adult. And most guidelines say uh, about this uh, uh, young adults are 2B. So they were saying there should be a class of, uh, the guideline class of recommendation should be heightened. And also, uh, we should find your know, adult for as risk for MI, and uh, we should talk. We should more. We should assess them with high lifetime risk, and so that so that we can uh, recommend statin more and more. And this was editorial uh, in the published in Jack. So diagnostic risk assessment. They said let's focus on risk factors, not just risk scores. And uh, we should think about considering modifying risk factors for these young individuals. And if there are riskiness or present, let's go for more uh, aggressive treatment. And also um, they were suggesting screening for some clinical atherosclerosis. And I think uh, coronary calcium score can be a good tool. And also they were talking about lipo LP little a as a polygenic risk uh, factor as well. So uh, let me continue on with uh, my case that I previously uh, showed you. So we have seen the residual heavy plaque burden at proximal RCA. So what should I do? So this patient was actually on Roche was statin 10 milligram because he was diagnosed this name before. However, he was still at 125 elder cholesterol. So uh, let's think about it. if we use, uh, we double the Roche was statin to high intensity, it's got 20 milligram, but it's still, you know, get down only 6%, above 100 still. And we, I add azetimibe, I might break down 20%, but still about 94. We are not seeing reach of the goal. So what I did was that I doubled statin, added azetimibe, and used uh, evolocumab, which is PCK9 inhibitor right of the PCI, so that I could really break down LDL cholesterol. 
and I could see LDL32 uh, at the um, one month outpatient clinic visit. So this is our NGO about one year later. So compared to the NGO the right after um, the PCI, you see smoother contour, and you can also see from OCT that I don't really see much of a, a lipid core, and this section is the uh, culprit, and now pretty much thickened fibers cap, and I don't really see hybrid features, so no need for stenting for this patient. And in fact, I'm uh, maintaining CCK9 inhibitors for three years now, and he's about LDL plus 22. Uh, he's not having any events. Uh, so my summary is that lifetime risk evaluation should be done with consider consideration of lifetime accumulation of LDL cholesterol. And we should pay special attention to risk enhancers in addition to high LDL, like smoking and diabetes. And I suggest that we should screen for subclinical ASCBD. And I think using tools as a chronic calcium score would be a very good choice. And again, FA should be taken very seriously as they have very high risk. And uh, I suggest that we should have more aggressive approach should be considered in your adult with high risk because we all know that the lower is the better and earlier intervention matters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Wonjie. Uh, again, a very uh, good set of uh, lectures. Uh, it's very relevant, especially for our population in Southeast Asia. South East Asia. I see a lot of patients with uh, young MIs. Our national statistics is about um, five to seven point five percent below the age of uh, forty, and we've seen as young as nineteen years old, and often associated with smoking, uh, yeah. which is good. Modifiable yeah. risk. Um, in terms of the risk costs, you've mentioned that. A lot of time they underestimate um, the risk of MIs. Um, in your country or where you are right now, which risk score do you use and how do you find them? Are they applicable to your, your young cohorts? So we're also using PCE uh, equation. However, uh, we actually use a little bit different. So um, we modify a little bit to Korean population because there was a discrepancy if we do, you just PCE the original to Korean population. So we modified it, but still for younger population, I think it's still underestimating. So, um, so as a lot of uh, some of, you know, experts says, I think just using PC you know, will not really you know, do the job for us. You might need to think about new score or, so you mentioned about smoking, right? So typical MI patient in young MI patient I see are smokers. You know? They don't have hypertension diabetes, but they're smokers. And after PCI, we do the a test and they're found that they have high LDL cholesterol. So I see those really two are factors that are very uh, taken more seriously in this population. So yes, that's uh, what I experienced. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Smoking and uh, the presence of elevated LDL in the background, it just causes blood rupture, very rampant. Um, you also mentioned the use of coronary artery uh, calcium scan um, in the young population. That's very interesting. I use it every so often. However, how do you monitor them? I mean, like you, we know that once you've started them on statin therapy, the calcification would uh, increase. Um, <laughs> it's right. also a cost for concern, right? Uh, yeah. When you cast them again, or do you intensify the therapy because the calcium goes up after about five, six years or so? <laughs> I mean, uh, what do you do? What's your approach? So um, the guideline really actually uh, suggests us to use chronic calcium for the just first time. They don't really recommend it to re repeat it because as you mentioned, if you statin, definitely course growth goes up. And uh, um, there isn't much value for following up because we know once started, coronary calcium has started, it just go on and on and on. So um, since a lot of Koreans get um, pulse checkup, so actually in my clinic, uh, not 20s, but people between 30 to 50, uh, they get annual checkup and these annual checkup tend to include coronary calcium score in many times and they visit my clinic. So that's a routine pathway that I, Go through. So, if I see those patients, uh, if you know, calcium is elevated, regardless of score, 
I, I check LDL cholesterol and uh, if I, most of the time it's, it's more than 130, even one, more than 100, I just recommend statin and just follow up. Absolutely, I think that is the right way to do. Um, risk modifiers, um, LPA. Now it's going to get a lot more traction in the near future with the availability of therapy against it. Um, do you use it widely in your practice? Uh, so we we measure at least once. So most of my patients, especially my patient, uh, we check. Uh, uh, at uh, their discharge once. So, and also current guidelines is what uh, is what's recommended at least one time in their lifetime. So we check just at least once. Uh, but what we found is that um, I know that LP little a elevation is quite common in Western population. I do not know the exact number, but around I think 30% having more than LP little a of 50 milligram. But uh, we have done a little, you know, screening study in our patient population. But I think the, the proportion of elevated LPA is actually a little much lower. Um, we felt that it's it's around 10%. Well, I cannot, it's not like national registry data, but we've seen that in Asian population, well, the importance of LPA little a cannot be ignored, right? It's very important, but the proportion of people having high LP little a seem to be much lower uh, in Asian population, I mean, Korean population compared to Western people. That's an interesting finding. Uh, okay, Dr. Wonjay, thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your talk. Right, um, I must apologize to my co-chair, uh, Professor Huang, because um, I now have, I'll be introducing him. He was meant to introduce Dr. Wonje earlier on. Um, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Professor Po Shun Huang, um, who will be lecturing on the primary prevention of ASCVD um, between the age of 40 to 75, primary prevention, as our, the speaker following Dr. Professor Huang will be talking about secondary uh, prevention. Professor Huang is Professor and Division Chief from the Institute of Clinical Medicine, National Yangmin Chiaotong University from uh, Taipei, Taiwan. He is also a, a, an internal phys uh, physician. Um, his uh, research has been uh, pretty much focused on uh, endothelial dysfunction and atrovascular, uh, atrosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So without much um, ado, I would like to introduce you, Professor Huang, for the next uh, lecture. Professor Huang. I thank you, Professor Kassing. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to present the latest 2022 Taiwan Lipid Guidelines for Primary Prevention on behalf of our society. Uh, I'm Dr. Huang from Taipei, Taiwan. The Taiwan Society of Lipids and Ulcer Sclerosis in association, the major society in Taiwan, published the uh, Taiwan Lipid Guideline for high-risk patients in 2017 led by our pre, uh, pre, uh, president, Professor Yi Hen Li. The optimal lipid target and treatment strategies were recommended for high-risk patients, including those uh, with coronary disease, PAD, diabetes, CKD, and familial hyperproteinemia. In this guideline, we recommend that uh, the uh, LDL cholesterol should be lower than 100 in PAD, lower than 70 in stable CAD, ACS, and suggested uh, LDL cholesterol lower than 55 mg per deciliter in DM combined with ACS. The Taiwan Lipid Guideline for high-risk patients was modified in 2022. The modified LDL cholesterol target in high-risk population include suggest lower LDL cholesterol target to uh, 70 mg per deciliter in PAD patients and also in patients with ischemia stroke, TIA, and cerebral or cardiac osteosclerotic stenosis. Today, our focus will be in Taiwan Lipid Guideline in Prime Prevention. So the outlines of my talk today include definition of Prime Prevention, SCAR Prime Prevention, the risk assessment, LDL cholesterol target, non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic therapies. The Taiwan Society of Lipid and Osteosclerosis in association with the other seven societies developed this new lipid guideline, focusing on subject without clinically significant SCAR since 2020. 
First of all, let's talk about the definition of crime prevention and how to define the ASCA. The clinically significant ASCA include coronary disease, uh, such as angina with positive stress test and all major coronary diameter stenosis more than 50% by image studies, acute current syndrome such as myocardial infarction and unstable angina, cerebral vascular disease such as TIA, ischemia stroke, cardiac artery diameter stenosis more than 50% by image studies, PAD with major extremity artery diameter stenosis more than 50%, and evidence of arthroscorotic disease, such as AAA by image studies. So the treatment algorithm of LDL cholesterol for ASCA prime prevention is shown in this slide. Subject without clinical evidence of ASCA was included in the prime prevention. Based on the above mentioned risk factor evaluation, the subject with prime prevention can be classified into the following risk categories. High-risk patients in indicated subject with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or LDL cholesterol higher than 190. In those without DM, CKD, or LDL cholesterol more than 190 milligrams per deciliter, we suggest identify the number of risk factors of cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, aging, family history of cardiovascular disease, low level of HDL, smoking history, and metabolic syndrome. The ASCA prime prevention risk assessment. In Taiwan, a point-based prediction model to predict the 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease was developed from the Jinsan Community Cardiovascular Cohort Study in 1990. However, the definite cutoff point to define the high risk was not indicated. At current stage, using the numbers of risk factor is a more convenient way for risk stratification in Taiwan. So the ASCA six risk factor in Taiwan in our guideline would suggest the following. The first one is the hypertension. And the second one is the aging group. If the age higher than 45 years in men and or higher than 55 years in women, or have uh, the penopausal women. The third point is the family history of premature CAD. The fourth is the low HDL levels. The fifth is smoking history. Or the last point is the metabolic syndrome. Because the central obesity, pre-diabetes, and triglycerides are also considered to be as risk factor in some studies. So metabolic syndrome that include all these items is regarded as a sixth independent risk factor in this new guideline. So the study shows the use of the sixth edge as the formula memory, the high BP, high edge, history of CBD, low HDL, smoking, and high body weight. Since the ASCA is a major problem contributing to significant mortality in populations with DM and CKD, so these two groups of patients are considered at high risk, there's no doubt. But uh, severe hypercholesteremia defined as having the LDL cholesterol higher than 190 carries a significantly high risk of ASCA and premature cardiovascular event because the subject with LDL cholesterol higher than 190 is a very unique and high risk group with a distinct long-term clinical outcomes. So those with LDL cholesterol higher than 190 is suggested to define as the high risk and immediate lipid lowering therapy is suggested. So in subjects without diabetes, CKD or LDL higher than 190, the risk of ASCA should be class classified as minimal, low or moderate risk according to the risk factors. So subjects with more than two risk factors are indicated as moderate risk and those with one risk factors are indicated my risk. Subjects without any cardiovascular risk factors are indicated uh, minimal risk. So that's our uh, the risk category. Then we will talk about the LDL cholesterol target. For subjects with diabetes, CKD, or LDL higher than 190, this guideline suggests that the LDL cholesterol level for insertion of therapy and treatment target is 100. 
milligram per deciliter. In subject with more than two risk factors and LDL cholesterol uh, higher than 115, non-pharmacologic therapy should be initiated and the LDL cholesterol target is less than 115. In subject with one risk factor and LDL cholesterol higher than 130, non-pharmacologic therapy should be initiated and the LDL cholesterol target is less than 130. And in subject with, uh, without any risk factor and LDL cholesterol higher than 160, non-pharmacologic therapy should be initiated and the LDL target is suggested to be lower than 160. So the LDL cholesterol levels for initiation of therapy and treatment target in subject with two with more than two risk factors is, is 115 uh, milligram per deciliter based on the ISPERS consensus. And this recommended LDL cholesterol level is close to the 2019 ESCDP guidelines suggested that the LDL cholesterol level less than 116 milligram per deciliter in the low risk individuals. And this recommended LDL cholesterol uh, target of 115 uh, is lower than that in Japanese and Korean lipid guidelines where the LDL cholesterol target is less than 140 milligram per deciliter for moderate risk in Japan. And this is Korean lipid guideline and uh, they suggest that lower than 130 milligram per deciliter uh, than in patients with uh, more than two uh, major risk factors. So let's talk about the non-pharmacologic therapy in 2022 Taiwan Lipid Guideline for Prime Prevention. So several observation and the randomized clinical studies have demonstrated association between a low risk of ASCA and healthy dietary patterns, such as uh, Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, and healthy Taiwanese uh, food diet. So in this, in this guideline, we suggest that uh, the uh, population should take more the Mediterranean diet dash diet to reduce the cardiovascular risk. About the exercise, all adults are encouraged to engage in at least 150 minutes per week of accumulated moderate intensity aerobic physical activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity to lower the ASCA risk. Even exercise with a short duration of five to 10 minutes with one to two minutes interruption is also uh, to be uh, beneficial as the lo longer ones. About the cigarette smoking, cessation of cigarette smoking is highly recommended to reduce the overall cardiovascular risk. And people who do not have a habit of alcohol consumption should avoid starting drinking for any reason and alcohol consumption should be limited to uh, less than 100 grams per week in men and less than 50 grams per week in women without the outside to dysfunctional LDL. The healthy lifestyle, diet rich in the plant-based food source of omega-3 fatty acid, fish, nuts, and ligaments, Lean animal protein, which can maintain healthy body weight, is highly suggested. And also minimize the impact of trans and transaturated fat, processed meat, and refined carbohydrate is recommended. So the healthy lifestyle recommendation, regular physical exercise is highly recommended, and re reduction of alcohol intake and cessation of smoking are suggested. So let's talk about the pharmacologic therapy in lipid guideline for primary prevention in Taiwan. The recommendation about the drug therapy starting, starting are the first night therapy and the benefit of starting for primary prevention of ASCA is well established. So it is reasonable to initiate moderate uh, uh, intense starting first and titrate to high intense starting if the treatment goal is not reached. So for prime prevention in subject without clinically significant ASCA, risk stratification is necessary to determine the lipid lowering strategy. So for prime prevention subject with diabetes, CKD, or LDL cholesterol higher than 190 are at high risk of ASCA. And the suggestion is that the immediate lipid lowering therapy is necessary. 
In subject without diabetes, CKD, or uh, LDL higher than 190, the risk of ASCA should be classified as minimal, low, or moderate risk according to the number of risk factors. So the intensity of starting is divided into three categories, high intensity starting, the dose could reduce the LDL cholesterol by greater than or equal to 50%. Moderate intense starting, the dose could reduce the LDL cholesterol by 30 to 49%. And the low intense starting, the dose could reduce LDL by less than 30%. So in subject with diabetes, CKD, LDL higher than 190, immediate uh, lipid lowering therapy should be started and the LDL target is less than 100 milligram. In this guideline, we suggest that in patients with LDL higher than 190, moderate to high intensity startings combined with ezetimibe is recommended. And in subject uh, with more than two risk factors and LDL cholesterol higher than 150 milligram per deciliter, non-pharmacologic therapy should be initiated and the LDL cholesterol target is less than 115 milligram per deciliter. And if the treatment target is not met after three months of non-pharmacological therapy, moderate intense starting should be considered. So in subject with one risk factor and LDL cholesterol concentration is higher than 130, a non-pharmacologic therapy should be suggested and the LDL cholesterol target is less than 130 milligrams per deciliter. And in subject with one or zero risk factors, uh, if the LDL target is higher than uh, 160 and not achieved after three months of non-pharmacologic therapy, moderate intensity starting should be considered after short decision making. About the ezetamine, ezetamine uh, is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor that blocks dietary and bilateral cholesterol absorption at the brush border of the intestine and the efficacy of ezetimibe in combination with starting for prevention of ASCA has been well established in patients with CKD or ACS in large scale studies. So ezetimibe may be used in combination with starting in patients with prime prevention who could not reach the LDL cholesterol target with starting alone. And ezetimibe may be used as monotherapy in patients with prime prevention who cannot tolerate the starting. About the PCSK9 inhibitors, PCSK9 inhibitors bind to LDL receptor on the surface of hepatocytes, leading to degradation of the receptors and decreasing the reuse of LDL cholesterol receptor. So antibodies of PCSK9 interface is uh, binding with the LDL cholesterol receptor, resulting in higher uh, hepatic LDL receptor expression and lower plasma LDL cholesterol levels. So PCSK9 inhibitors can be considered for prime prevention in patients with uh, high risk who cannot achieve LDL cholesterol target uh, with high intensity or maximal tolerated statins combined with ezetimibe. Other lipid target and ratio risk recommendations about the non hdl cholesterol and APOB can be considered to predict uh, the risk of ASCA especially for patients, for people with high TG, more than 150 milligrams per deciliter, uh, diabetes, obesity, or metabolic syndrome. In 2019 uh, ESC guideline, the APOB is recommended to be less than 65, 80, and 100 milligrams per deciliter for very high, high, or moderate risk people, respectively. However, since the APOB cannot be measured in most hospital or clinics and rarely used in clinical practice in Taiwan. No specific target for APOB uh, is recommended in this guideline. About the non hdl cholesterol is suggested to be used as a secondary target. And the target of non hdl is 30 milligram per deciliter above the recommended LDL cholesterol targets. The TG, Unlike the great success of LDL cholesterol lowering agent in preventing ASCA, so almost all TG lowering agents failed to improve cardiovascular outcome under starting therapy in the clinical trials. The reduced age evaluated the efficacy of purified high dose EPA. After a median of, uh, of five years follow up, the iso 
I saw uh, ICO sub and SEO group had 25% low risk of cardiovascular event compared with the possible group. So in this guideline, high dose EPA therapy can be considered for patients with Oscar or with diabetes. Uh, more than one risk factor who are already on mass tolerated starting therapy with high TG level, more than 150 milligrams per deciliter, and the level of evidence is 2A. So this is my take home message. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my lecture suggests that the OSCAR risk assessment for non SCBD people uh, in Taiwan Prime Prevention Guideline. So the DMCKD and uh, LDL cholesterol level more than 190, we suggest that uh, this group is a high risk group and their LDL cholesterol target is, should be uh, lower than 100 milligram per deciliter. Moderate to high intense starting uh, is considered uh, in this patient, in this population. And then we should calculate uh, the six risk factor if they, uh, the subject don't have the diabetes CKD or LDL higher than 190. The six risk factors, uh, we have uh, uh, formula memory 6H. Uh, if subjects have two uh, or more risk factors, they are divided into the uh, moderate risk. If a uh, subject with only one risk factor, they are indicated as low risk. And a uh, subject without any cardiovascular risk factor, they are suggested as the minimal risk. Uh, we have uh, lipid uh, cholesterol targets separately. So thank you so much for your uh, uh, attention. Thank you, Prof. Um, that was a very uh, comprehensive lecture again. Um, the development and utilization of the ACVD for prime population, how did that um, came about? What was the process and what was the, the rationale to uh, adopt that particular risk call? Uh, you mean adult, how to define the uh, CVD risk? Uh, I mean, uh, how did you, your team decided to utilize that particular risk score for the uh, Taiwan population? Mm. In Taiwan, the major problem limitation is that we lack of the uh, scoring system to just uh, calculate the, the 10 years risk of CVD. So we adjust the, uh, the number of risk factor to define the patient's uh, into the high moderate or low risk. So first of all, we divided the high risk as the CKD diabetes and LDL cholesterol higher than 190. Uh, that's the major part of the high risk of, for primary prevention. Uh, if subject without the diabetes CKD or LDL higher than 190, then we will calculate the numbers of risk factors. So this experience is fit to our uh, clinical practice in Taiwan. Uh, our Taiwan insurance uh, also use the risk factor numbers to decide how uh, LDL targets that we should provide the uh, lipid lowering agent. Very interesting. And um, has it been um, validated uh, prospectively? Yes. Yes, yeah, some group uh, already used the uh, uh, the risk, the numbers of risk factor to calculate the, the 10 years of uh, cardiovascular risk. Uh, but they published a small clinical studies in, in journals. So the, the point is that we cannot, uh, uh, we don't have the very well accepted or convinced uh, uh, evidence to use the scoring system uh, in, in, in Taiwan. I think that's a really important message to send across because there's a, there's a lot of risk scores being developed in different cohorts, being applied to different countries and different cohorts, which may not be appropriate. So I am in awe of your work of <laughs> coming up with your own native risk score. That's a very good point. Um, from yeah. a clinical point of view, you've mentioned the high-risk group. Um, what are your thoughts regarding uh, CKD patients on dialysis? Mm. Um, the evidence shows that they should be um, off statin therapy. Do you approach them differently? Yes. Uh, in the prime prevention guideline, we just uh, suggest a CKD not uh, without dialysis that should uh, aggressive and uh, early immediate to use the lipid lowering agent. 
but uh, patients uh, with end stage renal disease with uh, hemodialysis, this group, we suggest that uh, if they already keep on the starting therapy, we don't suggest they should withdraw the starting therapy if they uh, procurement stands in this high risk group. But uh, uh, if uh, end stage renal disease patients uh, with H hemodialysis uh, for many years, and then they put the current stent or has uh, acute coronary syndrome, this group that we don't have uh, definite consensus about should we use the starting or lipid lowering agent in this uh, group. Some nephrologists uh, just uh, suggest that we don't need to use the startings in this uh, end stage renal disease with HD group because the clinical evidence showed that no benefit in this high group. But for cardiologists, maybe uh, interventionists, uh, that we still suggest that we may use the uh, startings in this in this group. Yeah, we are we are very concerned about patients coming back to us, so I I don't think it's um. It's not a, it's a good approach. Okay, Professor Huang, I think I will uh, let you take over the show right now. Uh, Thank you. Apologies uh, again for jumping the gun for the second speaker. Uh, please carry on. Okay, so now our next speaker is uh, Professor Adu, Adu M, a, a share hub, a professor of cardiology, uh, who is the Assistant Dean of Medical Education, Chairman of Cardiology Fellowship, R. Robert Bro Council, Chief Editor of NEMJ, Department of Internal Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, Health Science, United uh, Arab Emirates University, UAE. So uh, Dr. Sheham will now provide our uh, next talk the topic is the dyslipidemia management for high, uh, primary prevention of ASCA in reproductive years. So let's welcome Professor uh, M. Barbie, please. Yeah, we see your slide. It's recorded actually, so thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the presentation is so recorded. Good morning, um, and um, um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'll be discussing with you secondary prevention of ASCVD, um, focusing on the sleepidemia at range age of 4 to 75, and uh, these are my disclosure. Um, will establish that the sleepidemia play a major role in cardiovascular outcome um, based on a trial, which is a randomized clinical trial compared to placebo and reduce LDL, uh, reduce the, um, the events, cardiovascular events. The importance of that starts based on the uh, level of the LDL when we start and the time we uh, reduce the LDL. So the more we exposure to high LDL, the longer time, the worse the plaque, the worse the outcome. And this is uh, based on the studies uh, well established. So that's why it's important when we manage patient with the dyslipidemia, especially the secondary one, is patient to be on this medication for life. So uh, to get the benefit, and this benefit rel relatives and absolute will be sustained. So uh, LDL level time, uh, equal uh, plaque uh, reduction. Uh, one of the best randomized clinical trials has been in the field of dyslipidemia, no comparison. Uh, these are the medication, uh, established medication, lowering uh, lipid therapies, and there are some investigation, one coming. And um, uh, of course, a statin, which uh, has been available uh, for a long time, will establish many years of uh, trials, uh, with uh, minimal, minimal side effects. Um, and um, then uh, we get a great reduction of the LDL, those who are responder. And if you add azetamibe, of course, you get 10 to 20% reduction. Uh, then uh, if add PCSK9 or the new one coming, then you get even up to uh, 85 reduction, as you can see here. And we have uh, guidelines, of course, will be based on this randomized clinical trial to tell us, to guide us how to uh, use this medication and based on their evaluation, based of the risk factors, based of the uh, 
Um, then if we are in the gray zone, we have something called uh, a CVD risk enhancer. Uh, and this is uh, another way of illustrating that. So uh, patients coming to us with uh, this lipidemia, we uh, do a risk assessment with life modification, very important, um, that's diet and uh, physical activity. Um, we discuss with the patient the side effects and the benefits of the medication, the cost. And of course, this is shared decision at the end of the day for, for medication to continue. These are some risk we, uh, score we use to evaluate uh, the total risk uh, assessment of the patient for cardiovascular event. Of course, when we use medication, and uh, this is important to be discussed, that the patients uh, might have side effects, um, accuracy of quantifying risk factors, of course, based on the uh, which one is suitable for your region. Of course, again, based on life expectancy of the patient, benefit the patient might get from this, then uh, interpreting the, uh, the evidence in an appropriate way. Secondary prevention, which is our focus today, um, these are the age we are interested in, uh, less than 75 years. And uh, those, of course, uh, with the high, you know, these needs, all of them need high intensity uh, therapy, um, which I'm going to show you because they are already established. Um, but what's the threshold and what's the goal will be based, of course, every time we're refining that based on the evidence comes. So if you can compare 18, to 2019, uh, European is adding, you know, two together. And even now, uh, we're going to show you a graph. This one will show you even you can go uh, lower uh, up to a one millimole, which is 40 uh, milligram per deciliter for those, those with uh, multiple uh, events. So again, when you come to managing patients with ACVD, is, uh, uh, lifestyle modification is important. No, uh, risk assessment is important. Uh, knowing the goal for the LDL is highly important, of course, and need to reevaluate <clears throat> these patients to know wh where we are aiming and what where we're going. So it'll be a shared decision. The restoration came some cases to make life easier and understandable. So as a 71 years old patient with multiple risk factors, you can see here already on the statin, had a mind in the past, and you can see the LDL is not in target after three months. So this patients, you need to add another medication, which will here is to be if, um, you know, um, maybe is it a might, you know, it will, and, and more em enforcement of, or you can even increase this one, make it 40 plus uh, uh, is it a might for uh, achievement of uh, the goal which is uh, less than uh, 55. And another lady of 62 year old, nanostemi PCI in the past and multiple risk factors, which is very common. Patient adhering to lifestyle, everything, but not tolerating is the MI. This is happens, you know, after some time patient not able to take the medication and you find yourself LDL not in target and not, not in the goal. So this patient, you need to think again, reinforce the, the, the uh, lifestyle, reinforce the, um, patient done the best of they can, but sometimes you make sure the patient adherent, that's very important because that's what we forget. Um, another example here, patient already on two medication, which is isotomib and the high intensity uh, statin, but not reaching the goal. Uh, it's another lady, the same. So these patients who are, you know, at very high uh, uh, LDL, despite of the optimal uh, combination, need to think about uh, here, PCSK9, which is uh, well established from two major randomized clinical trials we have available. And we have the third one, which is another one which worked uh, in Clisteran, which work at uh, uh, the gene level, uh, cellular level. Uh, you on less frequency, you get medication, which make again, life easier. Um, uh, let's go to the, um, think about a patient here of, you know, um, uh, presenting again is uh, uh, 50, 56, three months of follow-up to your uh, clinic and major risk factors already on the combination. And you can see the LDL is far away from the, um, uh, the, the, the goal. So you think about yourself. Is this patient taking the medication? Because not because you are giving the medication, uh, you're certain patient, uh, you know, taking it. But so that's very important. If patient don't take the medication, of course, it will not work. So that's well established. That's a big challenge, challenge for us, challenge for the um, uh, for the for the patients. 
uh, we know from the from the trials and registries that the statin usage is fine, uh, but high intensity statin has not been uh, that good uh, from many registries, and that's why we do not reaching the goal. And of course, there is a tamoxifen and PCS scanner, which is very important when you find yourself the cases I've just shown you. So these are challenges for us. So unless we are, you know, um, intensify our therapy, uh, uh, discuss with our patient about the goal and the importance of the adherence to the medication, we will remain, our patient remain uh, out of the goal. And uh, that's the major problem. And that's why patient having uh, um, the events uh, continues. So we know from the already discussed, these are the medication available, but only work when we use them. So uh, just in summary, you know, so the ages should not be a, a major uh, um, uh, limitation for management of the dyslipidemia should be the same. Uh, as I've showed you the cases here, we all um, try to get them to the goal, which is um, um, through the, again, uh, going through the, the algorithm, evaluation of patient risk, uh, lifestyle, and medication combination, ideally to start with, and reevaluate the patient. If they are not in target, then use the, um, you know, the, the, the more uh, important medication like PC scanner, which work on uh, even LPA, as we know, if, it's the, if, the, L, uh, if the LDL is, is high, of or LP, LPA if it's high. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adula Shahab. So thank you so much for your excellent uh, lecture. And from your talk, I uh, want to uh, uh, talk about the, uh, how to use the uh, image study, for example, the uh, cardiac artery, IMT measurement or coronary artery calcification. Uh, do you see, see suggest that uh, uh, we routine use the image study to um, to divide the high risk patient or non high risk patients? You know the thank you very much for the opportunity again. I mean because the title was focusing on ACVD, you know secondary prevention. So this patient already. You don't need any enhancement. You don't need anything else to, to guide you. Already patient established cardiovascular disease, the either the MI or stroke. So here is the, the, the goal is very clear. And I think you should, go, you should just try to use all the weapons you have to get to the goal with, of course, patient ad adherence to the medication and lifestyle. Yes. Okay. Also about uh, the very special population is the patients with TIA or cerebral vascular disease or uh, previous stroke history. Uh, do you think that the arterial cholesterol uh, target is, uh, should lower than 100 milligram per deciliter or even lower than uh, 70 milligram per deciliter? Uh, how about your opinion? You know, if I speak about uh, the patients we see in this part, we did lots of registries and uh, an average when they have their MI actually around 80, which is surprising. And, and if you just base to go below 70, that's not, a, that's not good. You need to go at least more than 50 percentage, which, uh, which speaking about 40 and less. So really it depends on you know, what, what part of you know, world you're working at and, and you need to look at that. Although the guideline is there, but you need to modify it to your region. Okay, thank you. So uh, another point that we want to uh, discuss is that uh, uh, patients with high LDL cholesterol higher than 190, that uh, maybe we will see them as the uh, very high, uh, high risk group. So do you think that we should use the moderate intensity or high intensity studying for an initiation of therapy? You know, with the ACVD patients of more than 90, I, I started to use, you know, the three together because I want to, you know, if I use only the combination, I will not get to the goal which I need with somebody already established ACVD. So I use the combination starting with the my plus PCSK9, you know, this is why my, I've been doing uh, for my patients with ACVD. Oh, so you will use the combination lipid engine for the initiation of therapy? Okay. Yeah. Great. So, if there is no further questions, I will thank uh, Dr. Adula Shahab for your excellent lecture. 
So we will move to the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Adi Mantian Abari from Indonesia. Dr. Uh, Abari is from Department of Cardiology and Vascular Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia, and also uh, the Doctor of National Cardiovascular Center, uh, Harapan Kita Hospital, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. So today, uh, Dr. Ara Ambari will uh, give us talk entitled as uh, Dyslipidemia Management for Prime Prevention of ESCA in Reproductive Years. So let's welcome Dr. Ambari, please. Th thank you very much, Professor Huang, uh, for the introduction. Uh, okay, uh, this is my slide. Is that uh, clear enough? Yes, very clear. Okay, uh, thank you very much again, uh, Professor Wang and then APST who invite me as a speaker in this uh, afternoon. And then um, my topic now is about uh, this lipidemia management for a primary prevention and ICVD in reproductive years. Actually, that is a little bit hard uh, topic for me. <laughs> and then um, my name is Ademidan Ambari and I'm, uh, I'm a, a cardiologist. My specialist is uh, in a preventive and uh, cardiac rehabilitations. And I work in the National Cardiovascular Harapan Kita and then um, I'm a teacher in the Department of Cardiology and Vascular Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. Okay, uh, so we should get started. Okay, um, in this presentation, I'll try to focus on how lipids are infected during normal hormonal changes uh, throughout the woman life cycle during adolescence, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, pre, uh, pre and perimenopause. And then uh, we will focus on the primary prevention, of course, and then uh, cardiovascular disease by examining uh, the sex-specific cardiovascular risk factor um, in each, uh, each stage and pay special attention to statin use, uh, statin side effect and non-statin uh, therapies. Uh, as a background, you know that uh, multiple lines of evidence have shown uh, the central role of dyslipidemia in developing uh, of atherosclerosis and major cardiovascular disease. Previous speaker talk a lot about the IC, uh, ICPD uh, in adolescents, in uh, adult, uh, and then a secondary prevention too. Uh, and then um, we should know in a, a primary prevention that uh, from the interhab study, there is a case control study, uh, more than 27,000 participants in a uh, uh, 52 country. Um, this Lipidia had the highest mortality of ratio, uh, about 3.2, and then followed by smoking, about 2.8, uh, psychosocial factors, about 2.6, and history of diabetes, about 2.3, and hypertension, 1.9. That is very important that there are currently no sex specific and life cycle specific guidelines for evaluation and uh, management uh, of lipid. Um, this is uh, uh, what happens in our countries in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, um, uh, paper uh, which is uh, uh, published in 2018. Uh, this is about dyslipidemia prevalence uh, in uh, Asia and mid uh, Middle East. If you see here in our country in Indonesia, we still found uh, prevalence of uh, total cholesterol is very high, about 43%. Triggers rate about 26%, uh, and then LDLC, yeah, high LDLC is about 83%, and then HDL about 23%. Uh, it's been why? Uh, because we cannot uh, achieve the uh, target of LDL cholesterol in here in Indonesia. Uh, the problem is not only about the compliance, but about the giving a high intensity statting here in Indonesia, a little bit uh, difficult because, uh, you know, uh, we are. Um, archipelagos. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of people come from the rural area, and then uh, actually that high intensity staking uh, cannot um, uh, cannot be uh, in the rural area, uh, and then uh, they just only have a simple statin, for example, like that for the atorvastatin, erosuvastatin. It's a little bit difficult here. Um, and then what what are the current guidelines in uh, this lipidemia say? Uh, we know that the ACC. Uh, uh, 2018 to 2019 about the primary prevention, uh, but, uh, but the ACC guideline, uh, it is stated that, uh, of course, that in the intermediate risk adult, statin therapy reduces the risk of ICPD. Uh, and then 
Uh, of course, that if a uh, decision that we made uh, given as a statin therapy, of course, we can give a moderate intensity statin. Uh, and then uh, if there is intermediate risk, uh, LDLC level should be reduced about 30% or more. And then for the optimal ICP, there is reduction, especially in patients with high risk. Um, <clears throat> we should reduce the LDLCs uh, more than 50%. And then, uh, <clears throat> Of course, that in the 40 to 70 years of age with diabetes, we can give a moderate intensity statin. And then of course, uh, maximal tolerance statin therapy is recommended. There is no cutoff uh, for the lower uh, LDLC cholesterol, of course. And then, but we should give uh, uh, the maximal tolerance statin to the patient's ages uh, 20 to 75. This is the guideline from the EAC uh, and then published in 2019 about the management of this lipidemia. It is uh, the same. The targeted is a reduction of 50% of LDLC cholesterol from the baseline, especially uh, in the high risk or very high risk population. And then uh, this is the flow chart. Uh, what I want to uh, uh, state that here, uh, we use a high intensity statin. We use azetimibe when we use PTSK9 inhibitors uh, for the uh, for the giving. I mean to 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 achieve the target of uh, LDLC levels. And then this is the 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 latest guideline from uh, EAC. Uh, this is. Uh, um, this is a primary prevention guideline in 2021, uh, released in 2021. If you see here, uh, the target actually, the target of the LDLC level is uh, um, reduced uh, more than 50%. And then uh, uh, the targets uh, below hundreds, even if there is a, a very high risk, you should uh, decrease it into 55 milligram per deciliter. And then our uh, Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology uh, uh, have a consensus, even though we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, give uh, what you call is uh, 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 recommendations in uh, you know uh, reproduction uh, ages. But here's that we uh, we know about the giving a statin in uh, uh, CVD risk factors. Again, uh, the problem is that uh, the, there are currently no such specific and life, uh, life cycle specific guidelines for the evaluation and management of liquids. And then uh, um, as a previous, uh, previous uh, um, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, doctor said that before, in uh, childhood and adolescent, uh, through hyperlipidemia, has not historically been true as a disease in children. Uh, actually, they uh, performed a screening, especially uh, routinely in pediatrics, and then from the National Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute, uh, they uh, uh, use, I mean, they uh, try to uh, have a screening for lipid for the total cholesterol, uh, HDL, and non HDL cholesterol at ages of uh, uh, nine to 11, 70 to 21. And then after that, they, they have uh, repeated again five years after that. Um, we know that early onset of Menards uh, before 11 is associated with the increased cardiovascular risk factor, including uh, more unfavorable lipid planar. <clears throat> yeah, it's mean that uh, if you uh, have uh, patients uh, with uh, early Menards, it means that uh, it will be uh, increased of uh, the risk of total cholesterol, LDL, and triglyceride. And then if we talk about uh, reproductive uh, years, of course, that uh, we talk about the menstrual phase, uh, pre-pregnancy pre uh, pregnancy and premenopause uh, uh, phase. The, the ages, of course, range to maybe um, 11, 15, till uh, 49 years old. And then uh, in the menstrual phase, uh, of course, that uh, the total cholesterol and the LDLC level is increased rapidly after menses. Of course, that because of that, I think that uh, for us as clinician, we should have a measurement of a, a, a lipid in a patient. I mean, in the in a woman, uh, we should compare in the same phase of menstrual cycle because it's, it will be different. Uh, 
you know, uh, um, in uh, a peak during follicular uh, phase, uh, in uh, because of uh, increase of the estrogen, it will be uh, increase of the uh, the LDL and then the cholesterol cholesterol, and then of course it will be declined uh, through the luteal uh, phase, and then. Uh, in the pre-pregnancy, uh, elevation in triglyceride, LDLC, total cholesterol, and non-HDL are associated with increased risk of uh, subsequently developing preeclampsia during pregnancy. Um, there is one of uh, RCT, which is uh, uh, tried to giving a statin, uh, if I'm not mistaken, proper statin to the uh, uh, to you know prevent the preeclampsia, but unfortunately uh, uh, that is not a work because maybe because they give it uh, late after 12, uh, uh, 12, uh, uh, 12 weeks, and then maybe earlier is better. And then from the uh, Framingham Heart Study Analysis, more than 500 uh, uh, parents offering pairs with a parental LDLC measure in the study before of offspring birth and conclude that maternal pre-pregnancy LDLC level are associated with adult offspring uh, LDLC level beyond the attributable uh, to measure lifestyle, anthropometric and inherent genetic factors. It means that uh, the mothers uh, give uh, uh, influence uh, to the, uh, you know, to the offspring LDLC level in uh, uh, for this uh, son or daughter in adult. And then uh, how about lipid profile in pre-pregnancy? Okay, so, uh, a uh, lipid profile in pregnancy. <clears throat> uh, of course, that the uh, total cholesterol is increased by approximately about uh, 35 to uh, 37 percent, and then uh, it will be uh, difficult uh, if we try to, uh, you know, uh, to have a measurement in uh, lipid profile for the patients in pregnancy. Of course, it will be increased about 35 to 37 percent in uh, in pregnancy. Uh, actually, uh, during uncomplicated pregnancy, uh, total cholesterol and triglyceride did not exceed uh, more than 20, uh, 250 milligrams per deciliter. It means that uh, we can wait uh, if there is exceed more than 250 and then we did uh, medication that we should know that if uh, the baseline level of uh, triglyceride uh, increase actually in pregnancies will be higher than before. Really high triglyceride and low HDL level during the third semester are associated with increased risk of blood and gestational age and macrosomia. Uh, this is uh, uh, what happened uh, if the uh, pregnant woman have a high triglyceride and low HDL and it, it's, it will influence the fetals, of course. And then a family hypercholesterolemia did not appear to have high risk of premature delivery preeclampsia, low birth weight infant or congenital malformations compared to women in the general uh, population. Um, how about the counterparsia about giving a statin uh, during pregnancy? Actually, uh, the, in uh, 2022, uh, FDR recently removed its strongest recommendation that statin be considered contraindicated during pregnancy. It's been that uh, we still give, uh, we still can give a statin to the pregnant woman, but I think it's very, very important that we should talk to the uh, to, to the uh, to the patients and their family, of course, about the risk and benefit. Because from the CAR studies and meta-analysis, so no teratogenic effect has been identified in women receiving hydroperic statin, such as prapastatin and rosuvastatin, but. Uh, uh, in contra, uh, there is a case series identified a small number of fetal malformation in women receiving lipoperic statin in the first semester. And then uh, increased miscarriage rates have been reported among women receive statin uh, in the first uh, some trim uh, trimester. It, it means that we should be careful with giving a statin uh, in a pregnant uh, woman, but uh, that's we know uh, actually some of our uh, clinician stop the statin about two or uh, three months before the uh, pregnancy, I mean, the program of pregnancy. And then uh, what is the current uh, recommendation on this lipidemia medication during pregnancy? Uh, when pregnancy occurs, the decision to continue statin therapy should be individualized based upon the patient risk profile. 
For example, in patients with a family hypercholesteremia, a woman with family hypercholesteremia who need LDLC lowering during pregnancy and wish to avoid statin, we can use another medication that we call uh, bile acid sequestrant, uh, for example, like cholesteramine. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, option for management of severe hyperglycerema during uh, pregnancy, more than 50 milligrams per deciliter, we can give a, uh, include a bile acid acid as a first strand, the acid fiber or omega-3. Uh, actually, uh, in my experience, uh, in uh, National Cardiovascular Center Harapan Kita, uh, it is very difficult to find a woman which is uh, sent by obstetrician maybe uh, due to uh, dyslipidemia because uh, it's not usual here in, uh, in Indonesia, especially in my country. Uh, they perform a uh, screening of this lipidemia before uh, the pregnancy. And then uh, the case is still low, but I think that uh, some of the case will be uh, actually that happened in our country. And then uh, for the premenopause, uh, premenopause women have a less uh, proatherogenic plasma liquid profile than men uh, with a high HDL and lower LDL triglyceride compared to age match men. Uh, and then as women age, uh, LDL increase uh, about two milligram per deciliter per year between 40 to 60 years. And then uh, from the in profit, suggest that women may be uh, benefit even more from uh, azetimide uh, when considering the total number of primary event. And then uh, uh, from the, uh, this case, I think that uh, we should have a uh, screening. I mean, the universities, uh, universal screening for the family hyperlipidemia, especially beginning with adolescents. Uh, some country uh, have a screening before the college. And then, of course, that uh, introduce about the healthy lifestyle, uh, about the exercise. And then early age is very important. And then, um, of course, that uh, in a pregnant woman, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes mellitus, uh, and then preterm delivery, will increase the ASCVD risk. Uh, and then we should know about uh, the increasing LDL and triglyceride in pregnancy. Uh, and then we can use statin uh, in the selected patient, especially in uh, pregnancy, but should be careful. And then we should uh, think about the risk and benefit. And then for the premenopause, sometimes we should uh, uh, try to make a uh, um, uh, examination about the uh, screening, yeah, about the chronic calcium score, and then carotid sclerosis as a primary prevention. Uh, in, um, as my conclusion, uh, there are currently no sex-specific and life cycle-specific guidelines for the evaluation and management of this epidemia. Lipid profile are altered by the hormonal changes during reproductive uh, ages. Management of dyslipidemia for the primary prevention of ICPD should incorporate a sex-specific cardiovascular risk factor at each stage, especially during reproductive age. And then, uh, of course, that we need uh, uh, more trials focusing on dyslipidemia management in reproductive uh, age. I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Amberry. Uh, excellent speech. So this is really a challenging topic. Uh, <laughs> uh, focus on the reproductive age uh, female uh, patients. So maybe we can discuss several questions. The first question is that uh, uh, if in young female patients, if the LDL cholesterol are higher than 190, very high LDL levels, uh, how do you uh, decide the uh, risk profile? Uh, high risk or low risk, how to define it? And the next question is that if the patients uh, belong to the high risk, how should we treat the patients? Okay, uh, actually, um, I mean, the guideline said almost, uh, the guideline that uh, we have now is very universal. It's mean that it's, it, it, it don't uh, make a difference between a woman and men, especially. Uh, and then, of course, that if uh, from, the, from the guideline, it is stated if uh, there is increasing in LDLC cholesterol, we should uh, start a statin even in moderate uh, intensity. And then uh, for the, uh, what should we uh, learn from this uh, presentation that we should be careful if the patient 
want to have a baby, of course, uh, want to have a pregnancy programs, and then we should, uh, some of the uh, literature said that we should stop the statin uh, two months before uh, pregnancy. Yes, okay. So the next question is that, uh, should we absolutely uh, don't use the starting in the uh, in a reproductive uh, group? How about your um, comment? Okay, thank you very much, Professor Huang. Um, uh, the, the most important thing is in the, in the pregnancy, of course, um, in the adolescence, in, um, uh, I mean, the pre-menopause, uh, we can use a statin as is usual, but the special case is in, uh, in, in pregnant women. Should we give a uh, statin? And then uh, it is stated uh, from the FDR, it is uh, the room for us to give a statin, but just very careful, talk to the, uh, the person, I mean, the patients, and because there is a risk of uh, teratogenic to the, the factors. I think that's all. Yes, I agree with you. And the next question is that, uh, could you talk about the other lipid lowering agent, for example, that the ezetamide or PCSK9 inhibitors? Yeah. Could we use that in the pregnant women? Yeah, actually, uh, there is no study, especially about PCSK9 uh, and then uh, ezetamide. Due to that, I think that we should uh, have a wait for the trials. And then for the reproductive ages, of course we can give it, but for the, for the pregnant woman, uh, some literature say that better for you to use a bile acid as question for that, uh, for the woman, because it's, uh, it's safe enough for the pregnant woman. Yes, okay. Okay, so my last question is, uh, in your slide, you talk about that we could use the cholesteramide uh, to reduce the maybe the cholesterol absorption or decrease increase yeah. the excretion. But yeah, yeah. The, the major concern is that this kind of drug is uh, has a lot of side effects. Yes. So if course. your patient tell you that doctor that I cannot use this drug, what do, should we do next? Yeah, um, of course that uh, there is no choice uh, because abdominal discomfort, constipation uh, sometimes happen uh, to the patients uh, receiving biological questions. And then I think that uh, we, we can try giving a statin with a low dose, maybe prapastatin or rosofastatin, which is, uh, I stated before, uh, with a low dose to the patients. But I think that informed conscience is very important for the, for the patients and the family. I think that's all, Professor uh, Ryan. Thank you very much. Yes, okay, okay. So many kinds of statin that, for example, hydrophilic or hy hydrolytic, uh, different kinds. So do you have yeah. any suggested statin that would could be better used in the pregnancy women? Um, from the study, uh, there is just only two statin that they use, prafastatin or rosufastatin. Prafastatin, okay. okay. Uh, prafastatin or rosufastatin. Rosufa, okay. okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, okay, thank you very uh, much. Dr. Uh, Ambaris. So we will move to our next speaker. And uh, the last talk, I will welcome Dr. Hayato Tata. Uh, uh, Professor Tata is from uh, Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Graduate School of Medi Medical Science, Kanazawa uh, University from Japan. So today, Dr. Tata will provide us a talk entitled as Primary and Secondary Prevention of ASCA by Dyslipidemia Management in Adults Higher Than 75 Years Old. So uh, let's welcome Professor Tata, please. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So can you hear me? I can. Okay. I good. can hear you clear. Okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Tata from Kanazawa University, Japan. I want to focus on the management of this epidemia in high age group over uh, 75 years. This is my disclosure. Now, first of all, I want to share with you the changes of causes of death in Japan. In the past, tuberculosis was the number one cure for Japanese in 1950s. However, there is a consistent trend that cancer and cardiovascular disease are increasing despite the advances of preventive and curative medicine. 
In this slide, I'm presenting the number of myocardial infarction as well as the number of deaths caused by MI in Japan. As you can see here, numbers of MI and deaths caused by MI are still increasing. Now let's move to the changes in population in Japan. The population was peaked in 2008, around 130 million, then showed a declining trend over the years because of the number of babies are decreasing. However, the number of population aged 75 or older, illustrated in red, is still increasing because of our aging. Why was the population demographics of Japan changing so dramatically? The answer is the increased longevity. In fact, life expectancy of Japan has been increased for more than 60 years. And now life expectancy of male is 81.6 years and that of a female is around 87.7 years. Um, sometimes I feel that Japanese people are rejuvenated. This slide shows the example of Professor Shikuro Manabe, who is the Nobel Prize laureate in 2021 in physics. He likes doing yoga, which may be quite beneficial to keep him healthy. Now I want to explain the fact that LDL is the causal factor for atherosclerosis. It is quite consistent that pathology, epidemiology, genetics, and clinical trials are repeatedly suggesting that LDL cholesterol is the causal factor for atherosclerosis. When we focus on the graph of LDL cholesterol and coronary heart disease, x-axis represents the effects of LDL lowering and y-axis represents relative risk reduction for coronary artery disease. We can see a beneficial trend of association between LDL cholesterol and coronary heart disease in genetics and pharmacological intervention regardless of genes and drugs. In addition, we can see the same lower the better trend, even if we can combine the results from different types of interventions for LDL cholesterol lowering. In the previous slide, I told you that total number of Japanese population is on the decline. However, the proportion and, and the number of population at, at higher age remain the same level. For example, we expect to see around 20 million population for more than 40 years from now on. So it is quite important to rethink about the in impact of intervention for LDL cholesterol among high age group who are expected to be the majority of the population in coming years. So let me summarize the clinical trials using studies. The first study, Brava study, was introduced in 1989, and the first strong study, Atrova study, was introduced in 2000. When we take a look at um, the initial trials, we see that individuals with high age group were deliberately excluded. However, there was one study named PROSPER that included high age group, and I will mention about this study shortly. So now let's move to the important story about LDL cholesterol lowering intervention for high age group. This slide shows the results from Copenhagen general population study, which is the large scale observational study we can see quite consistent trend that cholesterol level was significantly associated with occurrence of MI across all age groups, including very high age group. Some people argue that high cholesterol level among high age group is good 
in terms of a nutritional point of view. However, the reality is that cholesterol is bad for older age group as well. Uh, in this slide, in the left panel, this study is illustrating that the rate of occurrence of MI per 40 mg increase of LDL cholesterol. In fact, MI risk per 40 mg increase of LDL cholesterol among people aged over 80 years was three times higher than that of age 60 to 69. On the other hand, when we assess and NT number needed to treat for all individuals. Then NNT is the smallest in people among age 80 or over. That means that it is more useful to use studies for older people. Focusing on the people under the recommendation by the guideline essentially did not change this trend. So next, this slide, uh, is the result from observational study. Again, patients were, uh, with severe uh, stenosis at coronary artery were followed up, then divided into two groups based on the study therapy. This study included all ages, including high aged group. It is interesting to see that there is no statistical difference for survival based on study use among young patients whose age was under 65. On the other hand, there is a significant difference between two groups. Uh, we can see that patients treated with studies exhibited better clinical outcomes compared with those untreated among patients aged 65 to 79. Moreover, this trend was much more remarkable in the subgroup of high age group aged 80 years or older, we can see 50% reduction of all-cause mortality in the subgroup of high age group aged 80 or older. So this study clearly suggests that studies should be introduced for the patients with secondary prevention group, especially with higher aged group. Uh, let me move back to the interventional clinical trial using study. As I mentioned, the initial trials deliberately excluded higher age group. However, I will focus on PROSPER study, which included the patients with high age. This study included the patients with secondary prevention or high risk patients with aged 70 to 82, People were randomized into two groups using placebo or PRABA study. We can see only the modest difference in LDL cholesterol by 30 mg between these two groups, but cardiovascular events were significantly reduced by 15% using PRABA study. And this is a meta-analysis of studying trials for high age group, including PROSPER study. This suggests that all cause deaths is reduced by 22%, CV death is reduced by 30%, and reduced even among the patients aged 65 to 82 years. Now, um, I would like to introduce an interesting study named Utopia 75. This is a randomized study, including the elderly patients aged 65 or older in primary prevention setting, whose LDL cholesterol greater than 140 mg. And using the ezetimibe, we observed 34% risk reduction in this old aged group. So far, I have presented the results using a mainly a weak study such as PRABA study. In this slide, I'm presenting recent studies using so-called st strong studies. This is a meta-analysis of trials um, of the cholesterol robot recommended by ACC AHA guideline. This included not only studying trials, but also trials using edetzmibe and PCSK9 inhibitors. When we take a look at the primary endpoint, we can see 26% uh, 
risk reduction across all outcomes. In addition, we can see beneficial effects both in younger group less than 75 years and older group aged 75 or older. And now I would like to move to the topic of studying discontinuation. In general, polypharmacy sounds to be bad for health, especially for older individuals. However, when we take a look at the study which assessed the events after the discontinuation of studies, we see that studying discontinuation is significantly associated with worse clinical outcomes including um, admission of heart failure, ASCVD events, all-cause emergent admission, all-cause deaths, and composite outcomes of ACVD, all-cause deaths. And when we take a closer look at the results divided by sex, age, complication, and coronary heart, state, heart disease status, we can see that studying discontinuation is significantly associated with worse clinical outcomes across all age group. So finally, I would like to move to the topic of quality of life, QOL. Um, there is an interesting indicator called QORI um, that can assess not only the prognosis of the patients, but also their QOL. In this scale, perfectly healthy state is scaled as 1.0, then dead status is scaled at zero. For example, in patient A, uh, colored blue, who underwent PCI and been treated for 30 years and died due to other disease after 30 years. In this case, we can scale his query as 0 0.7 times 30 equal uh, 21.0. On the other hand, in patient B, Cara the Red had been um, healthy for 15 years but suffered myocardial infarction complicated with heart failure, then died after 50, 15 years. Then his query was 19.5, um, which is different from patient A, although the prognosis of them are the same. So in this post hoc analysis, the authors assessed the query of the patient in the randomized control trials using SIMBA study. The bars represent the improvement of a query in each group divided by the age of inclusion and ACVT risk for five years. Uh, we can see the trend that higher risk groups will be benefited more in terms of a query, including high age group. Although the degree of improvement among younger generation appears to be much larger than that in the high aged group. So I would summarize my talk today as listed in this slide. First, LDL is a causal factor for atherosclerosis. LDL cholesterol is strongly associated with coronary heart disease even among um, 80 years um, or older. A number of Acute cardiomyocardial infection is increasing. The rate is higher in higher ages. And there is no um, RCT using strong study for high, higher ages. However, observational studies and meta-analysis suggest that strong study can prevent coronary heart disease e events among high-aged group. And this study discontinuation is associated with worse clinical outcomes, even among high-age group. And finally, uh, studying therapy can improve QOL of a high age group. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Tata, a very excellent speech. So this is really a big challenge uh, in hand management of the aging population, particularly the uh, aging population, uh, dramatic increasing in many, many countries. Okay, so we may have some time for some discussion and my first question to Professor Tata is that uh, uh, many of our aging uh, patients uh, always worry about the uh, using of the lipid lowering agent could have uh, some side effects, side effect, particularly the uh, dementia, increase the incidence of dementia or cognitive dysfunction 
Do you have any comment about the question? Yeah, it's a very good point. But uh, um, I would, I, I always explain that there is no side effects in terms of the co uh, cognition because of the fact that there is um, a lot of study investigating, investigating this, this issue. So there is no significant effect in, in this matter. So I will explain this point. And also, um, when I see the patient with hypobeta lipoproteinemia, genetically very low level of LD cholesterol, um, in fact, I have an experience to see a lot of patients with low level of LD cholesterol, such as LDL is three, only three milligram or five milligram, but their um, ability to recognize anything is, is preserved, essentially the very good. So, but, but um, in, in terms of the fat soluble vitamin, it is very um, low. So, um, but in, in the case of the patients whose LD cholesterol uh, uh, around 10 is very safe in terms of this uh, fat vitamin. Um, uh, soluble vitamin. So I think I feel that as, as low as um, 10 to 20 is very safe. Yes, thank you. We also explained the uh, uh, situation to our aging population. So another uh, concern is that if, if we lower the LDL cholesterol to a very low levels, some neurologists may uh, hesitate that because may increase the instance of hemorrhagic stroke particularly in aging population. So if uh, our aging population already have previous uh, stroke history and you need to lower down their arterial cholesterol levels, uh, how do you decide to handle this patient and your arterial target is lower than 100 is enough or lower than 70 milligrams per deciliter? Okay, it's a, also a very good point. And um, uh, as you told, uh, I, I agree with you that there is some data about lowering LDL cholesterol is somewhat associated with increased hemorrhagic stroke, in, especially in Asian populations. But I think, I believe that LDL lowering is very important and good. So uh, in, in that case, I would recommend to reduce the blood pressure as well. So I believe that controlling blood pressure as well in, in, um, in, in addition to LD cholesterol lowering is rather safe. So I, when I want to reduce LD cholesterol very low level, I will take care of the blood pressure, extra care as well. Okay, so you suggest that the blood pressure is also very important to take care. So, uh, but if the blood test, uh, the LDL cholesterol level is around maybe 100, will you uh, adjust the starting to high intense starting to lower than 70 according to the uh, treated target study? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, so aggressive treatment, okay. Sure. Yes, okay. So another issue that we want to talk about is that the uh, myalgia, side effect. So as you know that uh, many our aging population have low back pain or muscle soreness, whatever. And, and if they take the starting uh, regimen and they complain that the muscle soreness, uh, how do you uh, handle these this questions? Yeah, um, it's also very important. I have several options. First is the addition of coenzyme Q10. And sometimes that, that agent will help the people to reduce the symptoms. And the second, uh, we have the uh, traditional Chinese medicine to reduce the symptom. I will sometimes, I sometimes use that kind of drug. And finally, I will explain the nocebo effect. Uh, sometimes this explanation uh, alone can help, help the patients to reduce the symptom. Yes, reassurance. Okay, so uh, will you adjust to a low dose of starting or uh, check the CK level regularly or titrate to the hydrophilic startings or even change to the ezetamide? Yeah, um, I would, yeah, I, I think I will try every option uh, to, to reduce the symptoms. I would try to change the statins and to 
back and forth and we'll try to use the detimide and we'll try to use PCSK9 inhibitors. In fact, PCSK9 inhibitor is, at, um, can, we can use PCSK9 inhibitor in patients with the studying intolerance. So um, it's the, I think it's the final option, but uh, so it, it's very expensive. Yes, thank you, Professor Tata. The, the last question is that I'm wondering to know the uh, situation in Japan. To, uh, how can you use the PCSK9 inhibitor? How about the regulation in Japan? Yeah, I think it's uh, almost the same in, uh, with the other countries. Uh, we can uh, primarily use this drug for the patients with FH and the patients with very high risk uh, secondary prevention settings and um, the patients for the patients with study intolerance. Uh, we will have to pay around uh, 10,000 Japanese yen for one dose. Uh, so it's equivalent to 100 US dollar for one dose. It's not inexpensive. It's rather expensive. I feel it's expensive. Um, but um, Japanese insurance uh, typically covers the 70% of the costs. Uh, so um, most of the patients um, are willing to pay the cost if needed. Yes, thank you very much. In Taiwan, we have very strict regulation about the uh, reimbursement of the drug fee, uh, particularly the PCSK9 inhibitors. So limited population uh, have be, has been used in, in, the, in the treatment currently. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Tata. Uh, thank you, uh, all your attendants, uh, all our speakers. So I will make a final summary and closing remark. Uh, today, we enjoyed the academic meeting a lot, and many of our uh, distinguished experts share their experience and suggestions in lipid treatment in many different groups, uh, from young age, middle age, high-risk group, and the reproductive women. And uh, the final conclusion seems to treat the, uh, push the physician to treat the uh, patients more aggressively and identify the high-risk population more earlier. So I'd like to express our uh, sincerely thanks to our distinguished speakers and our moderators and hope you have a very nice day today. So at last, do we need to have a photo for the uh, final recall? <laughs> our secretary staff. Okay, if yes, could you take a photo for all our speakers and moderator today? And also thanks Professor Lin Jun Li, Lin Jiao So Professor Lin for uh, his excellent uh, arrangement. And he is also our previous ex-president of Taiwan Society of Cardiology. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So see you. Oh, see bye you bye. then. See you all. Thank you. Bye Have bye. a nice day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.